When you think about the city of Paris, I think it's fair if the majority of your thoughts or if the entirety of your thoughts go to things that are above ground. But not today, because this is the Earful Tower. My name is Oliver G. You're listening to the AB Season, and you stands for Underground. That was some music from Press Maxon. Here's what he says. While I usually gravitate towards French artists for earful audiences, I'm proud of the musical diversity we brought to this season. I think it reflects the diversity of the earful community, and today's musical choice is an excellent example of it. The song is called Underground by Ben Folds 5, from back when Ben Folds was truly an underground sensation. I think it's perfect for capturing the fun of discovery that often comes with exploring the underground without sacrificing any of the artistry or gravity that sometimes comes with buried friends. If you're not familiar with the song, I'm happy to bring it out of the underground darkness and into the light for you today. Enjoy. Thank you, Press. It occurred to me today that I maybe should reveal what the song is at the end of each of this episode, but we're up to you. The season's almost over. Maybe next time. Uh, But there you go, Maestro Press Maxim with another great tune. But uh, what about underground? What are we going to do today? I think uh, it's a topic I've covered an awful lot in the past. So we're going to do a mix of today and a mix of flashbacks to some of the times I've literally taken this little microphone underneath Paris. So you're going to hear clips from when I've recorded uh, interviews on the Metro. You're going to hear clips from when I took... Uh, myself and a guest into the Paris sewers and then you're going to hear a frightening clip from when I went into the illegal part of the Paris catacombs but first I want to talk about the metro because uh, shout out to Jim McPherson a regular a long time regular listener uh, who pointed me out to a cool looking exhibition that is going on over in the 16th arrondissement. This is at the Cité Architecture et Patrimoine. Terrible, terrible museum name. It's, I said the same thing when I featured them for Notre Dame. Uh, it's like an architecture museum and they've got an exposition that started on the 8th of November running to the 2nd of June next year and it's all about the metro, the metro, Le Grand Paris en Mouvement is the name of it. And uh, if you go on their website and you look at the English section, you won't even find this exhibition, so I can assume a lot of it will be in French, maybe all of it. But if you are a metro aficionado, this could be the one for you, uh, a new exhibition there. I mean, the, the, uh, the Paris metro line is fascinating, and it is uh, expanding. So uh, even just uh, the the for the Olympics, they're making the line better between Charles de Gaulle Airport and Gare du Even just that is a big change. And uh, it's exciting to see how this uh, infrastructure continues to sort of lead the way. Now, um, when I did this episode that you're about to hear with Luke Thompson from Luke's English Podcast... I also put out an article, this is way back in the day, I put out an article about 30 things even the Parisians don't know about the Paris Metro, and I'll share it again this week, I'll share it in the show notes, but uh, it's fascinating, old pictures, uh, old facts, Uh, the fourth oldest metro system in Europe back from 1900 and carries 4 million passengers a day. I'm not surprised that there are people out there like Jim McPherson who who, uh, I don't know, really go deep, if you'll excuse the pun, uh, into the underground systems of certain countries, and the Paris one is no exception. But uh, before we get into anything else, let's go down onto Metro Line 2 with Luke Thompson and hear a little bit of our conversation about the Metro itself. to get on the train now it's very it's busy extremely busy why this are we is, doing this it's going to be quite embarrassing How that we're going to be talking like this i'm standing with a little fluffy microphone <laughs> we're going to get in the corner oh my god a lot of so people packed. are getting out okay so uh oh my let's just do it hello paris there's a bit of space down here look it's a private neutral space. excuse me what oh. okay so 
We're standing in the middle. It's perfect. We've got a perfect spot here. This is great. It is a bit We've awkward. actually got a, like a, a thing to hold on to as well and a little bit of space. Um, Luke? Yes? Tell me a little bit about the Metro. Well, what do you want to know well, about you're it? you're a comedian. Yeah. So you could do some observational... So, the, the, as a stand-up comedian People in Paris... People are laughing already behind you. You're doing well. Are they really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, as a stand-up comedian in Paris, the Metro is a great subject because, um, you know, everyone rides the metro it's like a shared experience and comedians always have something to say about the metro it's like a standard topic that we all talk about and i do some jokes about it too um and yeah there's lots of things to say about it really like you know first of all before i start talking about it i don't want to just sort of bitch about the metro because that's what people do sometimes no. i think there are some positive things that i should say at the start are oh, these are the disclaimers up these are the disclaimers yeah, yeah, so yeah. this is going to allow me to then say all sorts of negative things afterwards okay. so the positive stuff is that First of all, it works. Hang on, what'd she say? La Chapelle. La Chapelle, okay. We've got to keep an eye on it, because yeah. we have to get off and turn around. This is the station for Gare du Nord Station. Is One it? of them, yeah, you can get to Gare du Nord from here. Extra tidbit of information. Little bit of little bit of advice there for anyone travelling from Gare du Nord to Charles de Gaulle Etoile, which know, is where the hotels are. You know, what's the deal with they call uh, Gare du Nord, they also call it Paris Nord. Paris Nord, What's do the they? Matter, yeah. I don't know. I don't know about the history, Oliver. All I know is my own personal experience of riding these crowded trains. Which is less crowded now that everyone's got off for this Chapelle, uh, La Chapelle? A lot of people get off at Barbès and La Chapelle on so you, line so two. So you said that, that it works. Yeah, so I was saying it actually works. It, it's, it, it's always pretty much always on time. Uh, the trains are very regular. That Paris is not that big compared to London or Tokyo, both cities where I've lived in the past. And so, actually, it's a really efficient way of getting around the city. And so, from that point of view, it's great. It works. It does the job really well. In London, the, the, the tube often has engineering works or signal failure. Mm. Signals in London are just so rubbish. They break so easily. I don't know why, but the, many of the tube lines often have big delays. And, but it's not the same here. It's not the same, it actually works. No, it works. It's, it's very no, reliable. It's no Japan, though. No, Japan is... Did you, see the, did you see the story the other day that uh, J- Japanese rail network offered an apology because a train left 20 seconds early? Really? Yeah. <laughs> they go by the second, and no one had noticed. That would it. never happen here. No. No. Um, so, anyway, but it does work, and it, you know, it does get me from A to B, and I, I like that about it. And I always use the metro. I find it the, most quick, the quickest way to get around. Okay. But, having said that... Yeah, there you've, are, done, you've done your bit. As when I first arrived here, and I used the metro a lot, I I, um, I experienced quite a lot of culture shock here. Mm. And you're an Englishman. I'm an Englishman who, you know, as I've said, who's used the London tube and the the Tokyo uh, subway and stuff like that. Have you actually, you've been, you've lived in to- Tokyo. Or yeah, yeah. I lived in Japan for two years. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. Teaching English. Teaching English. Cool. That's right. Yeah. So in Japan, for example, there's like this. There's a quite a strong culture on the subway and on the train system right for example first of all everyone's silent people are pretty silent but yeah it's not too loud except when you get like someone playing an accordion yeah which for tourists is wonderful but for locals it's like oh bloody hell not an, not an accordion player um in japan though people because it's so crowded people make a lot of effort to be very thoughtful of other people's personal space sure. so for, and, and this is true in London as well that the London tube system is very cramped and small but people I get the sense that people try their best to sort of follow certain rules so the rules include things like making sure that you let someone off the train before you get on yeah, right. and that when you get into the train you move down inside the, the carriage yeah. like for example in, in London people will I get the sense that people are very uh, conscious of other people's personal space and to make the whole system work they have to do certain things like for example when you get off the train you have to keep moving mm. on the platform mm. and if you do need to stop you will go against the wall and get out of the way and all these things help the tube to run smoothly as a system. You know, it's generally understood that if you're walking along a corridor, you don't stop. Because if you do stop, the whole of London has to stop behind you. Mayhem. Yeah, it's total yeah. mayhem. Here, on the other hand, in my experience, there aren't these rules in place. You, and I, You could record a podcast in the middle of a bunch of people and they wouldn't react kind of thing. Well, yeah, but also just stuff like... I tend to find that when the doors open often you get people trying to get in when other people are getting out 
Um, the people don't move down inside the carriage. Sure, I've uh, some of the lines are better than others. We're on line two, which has new trains, and these trains are pretty good. And, and we've just more, gone underground as well. We have just gone underground in Co- Colonel Fabien Station here. Do you know who he is? No idea. No. <laughs> I don't. I told you I don't know the no, history. No, no, no. You, you need to speak to Amber Minogue. Amber Minogue, uh, friend of the show, friend of your Amber, show. Yes, your yes, podcast. very much so. Perfect place to end that little snippet because uh, he mentioned a friend of the show, Amber Minogue. She is the next guest from when I went into the Paris sewers. Um, a note about the sewers. I so this it's it's kind of I'm not a mega fan of listening to to my old old episodes because I feel like I've changed an awful lot. This that you're about to hear is from 2017. It's a fun episode, but also I feel like uh, I think I've learned an awful lot since 2017, especially now that I know there are a lot of people that listen to this podcast and who are sometimes quite quick to share their uh, reactions, their feelings about things. And I can sense even in this episode, I'm a little bit blasé. Like the the comment about, uh, oh, it's in French, so I don't understand anything. Like I spoke fairly good French then, I think. And it was sort of, I don't know where that sort of attitude came from. And I know it isn't ex- exceptionally conducive to sharing a story to a big audience. I think uh, it's it's kind of, it intrigues me to hear the way that I've changed. But still, it's fun being down with Amber, who's been on this uh, season a couple times now, being in the sewers of uh, Paris. So this museum, it is uh, it does smell pretty bad, but it's had a, a big renovation. I was there maybe six months ago and just checking it out again. And it is quite fascinating. I feel like I went in on this episode with the whole idea of, of this is disgusting, but I'm going to do it so you don't have to. When in reality, nowadays, I think I'd be more generous with my reviews of it. I think if you've got an interest in architecture, if you've read uh, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo and you want to really literally get in it, get amongst it and see what the, the, the sewers of Paris are like, I think you'd find this fascinating. Uh, also, I mean, people change over six, seven years. I probably changed in my interest as well. And the last time I was down there, I quite enjoyed it. So uh, don't be put off by the idea of the Paris sewers. And uh, if you really can't stand the thought, that's fine too, because me and Amber will take you down now into the deep underground sewers of Paris in the seventh arrondissement. Here we go. more about what I can smell, to be honest. It's not that bad. No, I can smell your scarf still. <laughs> That's a j'adore, by Dior. <laughs> I thought I was going to guess the same. But we've, we've come in, and it's all tours, all in French, all signs, all in French. So, so far, I don't know what uh, is going on. Mm-hmm. But I do see what looks like sewer water to my right. Is that what that is? Uh, yeah, I think that that's definitely sewer water that we can see down here. And it's moving at a slow pace. It is moving at a slow it pace. It kind of looks a little bit like the Canal Saint-Martin. And smells a bit like the yeah, Canal right? Saint-Martin. Yeah, exactly. So Which is testimony to how, you know, how efficient the sewer is. Um, I can see why this would not be on someone's, like, itinerary. This is one of the lowest rated museums on TripAdvisor, you know? Ha, 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 ha. Yeah. No. <laughs> <Why are you laughs> it's, it's underground. Oh it's like God. the sort of ignoble sister of like the catacombs. But what, yeah, right? But look, this is like on all the posts along the way. That's is that toilet paper? Uh, I hope not. I, I think it is. Do you think? And that that's looks disgusting. like toilet paper and uh, excrement. Just, yeah, this it is. It looks pretty foul, doesn't it? But do you know when this was? I don't know much about the Paris sewers, but when this was first opened, it was a hit. It was a hit. People came here. You could go around on boats. Wow. You could visit on boats. What Which do you is, th- there's, there's big claws for like a crane kind of thing over there. What do you think that's for? Fat burgers. Oh, oh fat burgers. I've read about those fat burgers. That sounds disgusting. Let's go and have a look. Okay. No, but I mean, when they first opened, it was a great hit and people were desperate to come and visit it because, you know, sewers are incredibly important for a city. You know, they stop us getting cholera and typhoid and mm-hmm. keep the streets relatively clean, even for Paris. This looks like the work of the Romans. Yeah, I know, but it's, I think it's more the work of... Um, I think Napoleon tried to really sort of sort it out 
And then Napoleon III carried on the good work. Do oh. you think, so the way we're walking now, there's street signs like they are yeah. above. Passage du l'eau, du l'eau. Yeah. The Galerie Brunesseau. So do you think these are matching the streets above? It feels like we're walking towards the Eiffel Tower as well. Like we actually are, I'm almost certain. No? Probably. I think they do match more or less like the roads up above. And, you know, it's like a sort of subterranean world. Oh, yeah. It's getting really loud. This is going to be disgusting. Oh. This is like a crap waterfall. Oh. oh my god. Yep, that's revolting. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm glad I got the scarf. Oh. Oh. <coughs> I can feel that chicken coming back. <laughs> okay, this no, is. No, this is disgusting. Well, there's lots of information. If you could, like, stop and read, we could find out. I'm not going to stop and read. No, we need to get let's away. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay, there's a bust of someone here. Okay. I, I, I'm going in. Eugène Bellegrand, an, in, an engineer. Okay, keep going. I'm struck by how loud it is here. It's extremely loud. Yeah. I don't touch any of the walls. No. So all of these, I'm kind of getting used to it now. How about you? Yeah, it reminds me, I've got three brothers. Ew. And the sewers <laughs> remind you of it. It reminds me of hanging out with them a little bit. <laughs> They don't listen, it's alright. They don't listen to the show. Not to come to your house. So I think like all of this stuff, you've got these little glass cages. Hang on. Cages, oh, boxes. floaty oh. thing. No. That's sanitary equipment. No. Sorry, <laughs> what did you say? I, I Things are floating like, beneath us. Oh yeah, we're standing on like a grate over this sort of like sewage water. And, there's, and they've kind of got these displays of like little um, historical, I think, you know, methods that they use to clean the sewer. Do you know it's going to end in a gift shop? Is it? Does it? Yeah, I'm sure. It has to. What do they sell? I'm desperate to find out. <laughs> right. let's, let's speed ahead. Okay. Well, fancy that. It did end in a gift shop. A pretty... Uh, I, I thought it was funny when I was in there. Six months ago again, and uh, I was like, "Why? what do you sell in a gift shop that's about the Paris sewers? Like, People aren't going to want to buy, I've been to the sewers on a tote bag. And it turns out they've got uh, just a lot of things about Paris, really. You know, pencil cases with the Eiffel Tower and that kind of thing. And a few books. It occurred to me to ask them if they wanted to sell um, our children's books. Because Kylie the Crocodile would have been a pretty good match. But I didn't. I didn't. So, uh, on that note, if you want to get it, you head to the Louvre or the Musée d'Orsay if you're in the museums. Now, um, let's switch topics entirely and go to the catacombs, the catacombs of Paris. This is a more recent episode. Uh, you've surely heard about the catacombs, the, the public museum that you can enter. There's often a long queue. It's pretty cramped. It gets very mixed reviews, lots of bones down there. Uh, fairly fascinating, but uh, a little off-putting for some people. I've never been wildly interested in that, but when I got... Uh, the story behind this is actually really wild. I, I'm gonna, I'll tell it in a book or something one day, but I, I got a yellowed map, an ancient map, sent to my P.O. box, sealed in wax, and uh, essentially it was an invite from a man who claims to be an eternal Comte, the Count of Saint-Germain, the Comte de Saint-Germain, and uh, he was on the episode for A of this season of the Eiffel Tower, taking me through the Biev River, and now he's back again. Him and Codex, two urban explorers who took me down for, I think it was four or five hours, into the illegal bit of the catacombs. It were all done in extreme safety, a wild experience. Since this episode came out, every now and again, I get an email, sometimes from super prominent uh, YouTubers and Instagrammers and stuff saying, how did you get into the catacombs? And I say, they asked me not to share any details and they asked me not to even share their details. And then these uh, Instagrammers and YouTubers, they often make some some big offer, you know, like, uh, you know, this is what we'll pay or this is the exposure that we can give the guides. And sometimes I, I, I yield to temptation, send it to to one of the, the guides and they say, nah, not interested. So it's actually super rare to get down there and rather intriguing. So the next uh, section is from me down in the catacombs. Hold on tight, we're going under.
Should I come in? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not gonna stay here, but you will see my light. I will what? You will see the light. Okay. I'm walking, I'm going in on my hands and knees. Can't, can't see where I'm going. I'm guessing. It was all happening so fast. I, the outside was already dark and uh, it was getting darker as I went through the tunnel. I was sort of sliding in backwards on a sort of horizontal uh, sort of well-worn series of rocks and mud, immediately filthy. And uh, it's, i got to say, it's pretty weird to be going backwards in to a place where you don't know where you're going and you don't know what to expect. And then the biggest surprise of all is when I got in there, crouching down, looking around, I couldn't see Codex. Where did you go, Codex? I'm, I'm here. Okay. Wow. You, you can follow. So now I'm crouching. Okay. So careful with your head. Yep, I'm down. I'm waiting for the comps. Are you okay, comps? Okay, so I'm gonna crouch and come to Codex. Already a lot of graffiti on the wall. And water starting. God, lucky I bought my boots. Good lord. As the Comte was uh, climbing in after me, I looked around and took in my surroundings with the help of the headlamp, of course, uh, graffiti on the walls. I say graffiti. It was kind of a mix of graffiti and street art, uh, which became a big part of the walk. Uh, But it was about, I don't know, about one hand length too short for me at the beginning. So I was crouched from there. Uh, It was quite thin, the, the tunnels, which changed all the time. There were always different heights and different widths, but big enough for someone to pass somebody else. It was extremely dark, of course, and it was quite chilly. But soon, as we got walking, it would warm up. I mentioned to Codex my surprise at how sort of neat it was, the lack of sort of rough edges. It's, uh, it, it is rough, it's just stone, but uh, it, you don't see it that much. And of course, there's a lot of people walking here. Yeah. This is the touristy entrance, so yeah, uh, yeah. if you come here on the weekend... Wow. It's like Montparnasse metro station at peak hour. <laughs> I'm interested, just, just to know, if, we could, if I could walk past you to see how hard it is. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So if we stay, Actually, if you want, you can be in the front for a while. Okay. Because... Uh, yeah, why yeah. not? Yeah. You want to, you can lead the way. Well, the echo is amazing. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. All of the great tenors, they come and train here. Do you do it too? Do you sing? Yeah. Wow. That was good. I'll do it when we get into a bigger room. <laughs> and we kept getting deeper and deeper as we continued on. Uh, the history lessons were flowing. You could see, you could see our breath all the time, which was kind of freaky coming out in front of your headlamp. But as we kept going, uh, they wanted to show me sort of further off the beaten track. It crossed my mind that if we got lost, uh, I would ha- I would be of no assistance. Like we were just constantly relying on Codex and his map reading skills. But I felt uh, totally confident in his uh, ability. And there were some wild sights, like uh, like. It wasn't just sort of street art like you imagine with paint. There were people who'd carved things in the walls. There were rooms with bones in it. There were deep drops off to the side. And occasionally you could see all the way up to the sky above through a manhole, through the hole in the middle of a manhole cover. But time flew. Obviously, you have no sense of time when you're down there. People talk of going down there for days. Uh, The next point that I brought out, the recorder, we'd been down there a lot longer. So... Whoa. As as I press record, we came to some more water. We've been down here for, whoa, four and a half hours, I'd say. And all of us are pretty sweaty. All of us are pretty dirty. And all of us, well, I think all of us are pretty tired. But we've come so deep in now that, like, there's not as much art on the walls. Like, when we first came in, especially when we're in all the rooms, 
Uh, it was art everywhere, like every cover, every wall was covered. But now there's a lot less. And one thing that struck me as, we, as we're walking towards the exit, I think we'll get there in an hour, is um, the little details. Like, there were these iron gates, open gates, marking where we were passing under the Montparnasse Cemetery. So we saw, we passed a couple of them, so we must have walked straight under it. Including, at one point, I climbed through a tunnel, found there was a room full of bones. For that Indiana Jones. For the past, maybe, maybe, I don't know, 45 minutes, there's been a lot of walking crouched. And uh, it makes the moments like right now, where you can stand up straight, all the better. But uh, I think Codex was right when he said I'll be sore tomorrow. How are you feeling, Codex? I'm doing great. You mentioned that if we're lost, we die? We, we, we are dead. We, we, oh. <laughs> we will die. Okay. It's okay, I won't die. That's the kind of... Uh, I'll take care of your body and, and make sure your loved ones <laughs> this is, get hold of it. Uh, this is, this uh, is the kind of positivity I love from the, from the man in the front. Oh, wow. Now we've discovered a room. So there's a well of water for the people working here. That's what I was going to say before, these small details like that well. If I stood on my own shoulders four or five times over, I wouldn't reach the top. And above it is a, a glass lantern hanging on chains. Just, um, I don't know, abandoned, I guess. Yeah, it's home improvements, you know. <laughs> people bring things this to is make them. Oh, wow. Another one oh, we... a small room to chill. So it's another one of these uh, circular sort of gathering spots with, with all these uh, old lamps and candle holders fixed to the roof, to the ceiling. Um, but I have a feeling we're not stopping for a snack. No. I have a feeling we're no, pushing we for the exit. Before they close the door. What happens if they close the door on us? We, we die. See, this positivity codex. <laughs> this is France. What does that mean? As Jean Cocteau said, French are Italian in a bad mood. French or Italian in a bad mood? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's why we prefer to use the opposite one now. Italians are French people in a good mood. Yeah. It's a glass half full, yeah. half empty situation. Uh, in any case, I'm looking, uh, I'm, 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 I can feel the sunlight hitting our faces as we come out on the other side. <laughs> Anyone feel like singing? There you go. Okay, onwards, ever onwards. And maybe, maybe gradually upwards. And so there you have it, three different undergrounds, the sewers, the metro, and the catacombs of Paris. I guess this episode was a bit of a medley, a way for you to realize just how much is going on beneath Paris, so much of which you'll never see. I mean, the vast, vast majority, even if you rode all the metro lines, you're definitely not going to walk all those catacomb halls, and you're definitely not going to walk all the sewer tunnels. So uh, in a massive metropolis like Paris, isn't it ultra unique to consider what's going on underground? And that wraps up this episode for the week. Thank you very much to the Patreon supporters on patreon.com slash the Earful Tower who make all this possible. Did you notice there were no ads anywhere? It's just patreon.com slash the Earful Tower for 10 bucks a month. You can sponsor the show and open up a whole Pandora's box of extras. I'll put that link in the show notes too. Otherwise, I'll be back next week with V is for something. Thanks to everybody who listened to this episode. Thanks to everybody who made it possible. And wherever you are, have a lovely week. My name's Oliver G. This is the Eiffel Tower. Merci beaucoup. And au revoir.